Cairo, Seattle. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, actor and filmmaker Zach Braff. Most recently, Zach starred in the ABC sitcom Alex, Inc., and he's best known for the film Garden State and his role on the TV show Scrubs. And speaking of Garden State, Zach Braff is from New Jersey, and his last meal is oh so Jersey. So light the candle on your bottle of Chianti, lay out the good red and white checkered tablecloth, because we're going to dive into the saucy, cheesy history of Italian-American food. Okay, I'm going to finish that accent now. With the department chair of the Food Studies Program at NYU, Krishnan Dure. And we'll talk chicken parm with my friend, former Long Islander and current cookbook author, Amy Pennington. And then you do a little marinara sauce, and then maybe a little mutz. Mozzarella. Oh, mozza. Huh? Or mozzarella. <laughs> we're going we're going sopranos. Style. I mean, that's yeah. my family. If I walked into it and said mozzarella or like ricotta, they yeah. would they're like ricotta. Ricotta. <laughs> yeah, like that's I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. But first, my interview with Zach Braff. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. We have buddies in common. I'm friends with Molly and Trevor Tuttle. Oh, my goodness, my no. neighbors. I just gave them my hot tub. Oh, I know. I saw it coming in with the crane. Did you, did you, did you see the pictures? They're I hysterical. did. Actually, you and I ate dinner next to each other at Pache a couple months ago. I was visiting them, and I said hello to you at the end and just was like, I'm friends with Molly and Trevor. So oh, this was, I remember that. Do you remember that? that? Yeah, yeah, with the girl with the red dress. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, so that's me. This was a star-studded dinner. Not only was I sitting next to Zach Braff at an Italian restaurant who I would later fortuitously interview about his love for a particular Italian food, but sitting behind me was another famous person. This is so like in the restaurant, there was this little nook and there were three tables and two out of the three tables had famous people. So behind me was Andrew Reynolds. So this is a person that I knew by face and by role, but I actually didn't know his name until I looked it up after seeing him. But Andrew won a Tony for Best Performance by a Leading Actor in a Musical for his performance as Elder Price in the Broadway musical, The Book of Mormon. But I love him for his role on Girls. He played Elijah, which I kind of binge watched last night. I went back and like watched a bunch of episodes because of the show. Now, I don't usually get super starstruck, but when I saw him, I got really excited and I couldn't order because I couldn't pay attention to the menu because I was eavesdropping on his conversation. And my friend went to the bathroom and I was just like, "Ah, I'm surrounded by celebrities. Are you a chronic eavesdropper? Because I am. Yes. If there's an interesting conversation happening in a booth near me or a table near me, I just ignore it's like a reflex my friends will be ignored yeah and i am solely focused on what other people are talking about me too and i have a friend who has a great knack for somehow sitting next to couples on a first date (gasps) and he's done a lot of live tweeting and live live facebooking of just awful first dates so i always hope that i overhear a first date but i never do And on the same trip to L.A., I actually went to Vermage, which is the vegan cheese shop uh, that Alicia Silverstone picked for her last meal because I figured if I was in L.A., I might as well drop in. Uh, Vegan cheese was good. Love the owner. So this was a very your last meal kind of L.A. weekend. But back to Zach Braff, who not only eats in restaurants, he owns them. Do you co-own or are you an investor in Mermaid Oyster Bar? Yeah, I'm um, I'm one of the owners of uh, Mermaid Oyster Bar in in the West Village of Manhattan on uh, uh, 79 McDougal. If I can give it a plug, um, <laughs> sure. And then I'm also um, co-owner of a restaurant in LA called Salt's Cure, which is um, which is a really really uh, great restaurant on on Highland that has I think the best brunch in town. So, are you a super food person? Is that why you wanted to get involved in the restaurant world? I love food. I don't cook, but I love food. And and um, and there's been just a couple of opportunities where pe- places I was going all the time anyway were like, we're going to move or we're going to expand. And do you want to invest? And I was just like, well, it's a, it's a no brainer because I, I I believe in the, in in the product. So sure. What would you want to eat for your last meal? Chicken parm. Oh, that was fast. Chicken parm is my favorite thing in the world. I could eat chicken parm every single day. You're from Jersey. That sounds like a Jersey boy thing to say. Maybe. We have a lot of Italians there and a lot of Italian food. 
There's a place in L.A. called Craig's I really like, and they make this amazing chicken parm. It's my favorite. What makes theirs better than the others? I don't know what they're doing in that kitchen, <laughs> but it's just it's just so good. I want to have it every day. I'm like, my mouth is watering, and it's like breakfast time here. Uh, is that something that you grew up eating? What is the attachment to that dish? Is it just the deliciousness, or are there any kind of memories? Yeah, I think we, I, you know, growing up in North Jersey, there was a ton of really good Italian places, and uh, we grew up eating lots of that kind of stuff. And I don't eat it that much, um, but I, I miss it. I love it. So what do you like to eat with it? Do you do, like, the bed of pasta, or do you do vegetables? I do, um, like, yeah, marinara on, like, um, I'm gluten-free, and so um, the, the other thing I like about Craig's is they have gluten-free pasta that tastes ex- exactly like normal pasta, and so that's really good. So I get, like, a pasta with marinara. Are there things that you miss from the East Coast that you grew up with? Uh, bagels and uh, cheese steaks. Those are the, my, my two favorite Jersey things. So you said you don't cook. Does that mean you eat out all the time, or do you do kind of like little eating hacks in your house? Uh, mostly ordering in, or um, in L.A., I get a meal service because um, I work so much, at, and I'm so busy, and I don't cook, and all those things combined. So they have, um, you know, they have these sort of healthy meals that are delivered in a cooler to your house every day. It's like uh, lunch, dinner, and like a snack, and the juice. And um, that's what I eat mostly in L.A., unless I'm going out to dinner, of course. Aaron Mason, I just looked at the Craig's website, and they sell a chicken parm hat. It's so cute. (laughs) It's a baseball hat with a tiny little stitched chicken parm on it with a little fork above it with a little twirl of spaghetti hanging down. And I just, this is like, I never thought there was a market for a chicken parm hat. Listen, I'm from the state of New Jersey, (laughs) much like our guest, Zach Braff. And I'm telling you, there is definitely a market for chicken parm wear. Chicken parm wear. Chicken parm. I'm so excited about this one. If you've never had chicken parm, shame on you. Otherwise known as chicken parmesan or chicken parmigiana. It's a pounded out breaded chicken cutlet topped with lots of marinara sauce and melted cheese, usually mozzarella, because for some reason, even though it's called chicken parm, there doesn't even necessarily have to be parmesan in the dish. And if you travel to Italy looking for chicken parm, you're not going to find it. It is strictly an Italian-American dish, just like spaghetti and meatballs. They don't put meatballs in their pasta in Italy. Total American thing. But chicken parm is said to have evolved from eggplant parmesan, a dish that is from southern Italy. So when a huge wave of Italians immigrated to America, they were poor, and they couldn't afford to eat much meat back in Italy. But in America, meat was cheaper, so it was something you could afford to eat fairly frequently. So when Italian immigrants started opening restaurants, they created versions of Italian dishes that would please the American palate. Americans love meat. We love anything fried. We love sweet. And we love big plates of food. So just like the Chinese immigrants created General Tso's chicken in America, which is a big plate of sweet fried meat, Italian Americans started frying up huge slabs of chicken breast and serving it in sweet marinara covered in cheese. But I want you to know the whole history of Italian-American food because it is truly fascinating. When we come back, how Americans went from despising Italian food to claiming it as our own. Ciao! If you turn on a cooking show or when you're cooking in your own kitchen, it feels like nearly every recipe starts with sautéing garlic and olive oil. But in the late 1880s, early 1900s, this was not the case in the average American kitchen. To the average American, garlic was pretty much the devil. Krishnan Ray is the chair of the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies at NYU. When was there a large group of Italian Americans coming to the United States? And how did that change our cuisine initially? Yeah, so uh, the largest group comes after uh, 1880 and into 1924. Before that, we have had a small group of Italians. By the mid-19th century, say 1850s, uh, Italian food was showing up as kind of a prestigious uh, food, what we would today call mac and cheese, but it used to be called, say, uh, macaroni or parmesan or something like that. Elite Italian food from the northern cities 
had become kind of prestigious uh, since Jefferson's time, who is partly credited for, so to say, inventing mac and cheese, take something Italian and make it uh, American. Uh, I would say the height of that prestige is when, in fact, there are very few Italians in the United States. They are mostly well off. And all that changes um, after about the 1880s. And mostly the Italians that are coming are poor. Many are illiterate. And most are coming from the South. Uh, so much so that by, say, about 1886, um, uh, I think the author of uh, Pinocchio, the Italian author of Pinocchio, his name is uh, Carlo Lorenzi. I want to just kind of uh, read a quote uh, from him. In 1886, he says, uh, the blackened aspect of the toasted crust, the whitish sheen of garlic and anchovy, the greenish yellow tint of the oil and fried herbs, and those red bits of tomato here and there, give pizza the appearance of complicated filth that matches the dirt of the vendor, end quote. So tells you about two things, the kind of the northern Italian disdain towards their poor compatriots from the south. And the second is that gets reflected in the attitude towards Italian food amongst American who begin to see Italians and Italian food and associate that with the food of the poor. There are lots of complaints by school teachers, nutritionists, that Italians eat all this garlicky food and uh, spicy food that gives them a craving for alcohol, uh, which is why they drink so much wine. And one of the ways of uh, protecting the American nation from these Italian bad habits, including their terrible food, uh, is in fact prohibition. And the argument for prohibition, the venom of it, is directed often towards Italians, uh, Italian food, and Italian wine. All that continues through much of the first half of the 20th century. What were people in the United States eating at that time in the late 1880s and the early 1920s that this food seemed so foreign and unappetizing? First, Americans are mostly eating what I would call northern European food. Uh, so a lot of butter-based uh, sauces, meat and potatoes, call it in some ways Germanic food, uh, potatoes and sour cream with dill and, of course, steak, or fried chicken, say 1880s. There are not only a lot of Italian immigrants, there are also a lot of German immigrants. In fact, German food will become American food hamburgers, hot dogs, cabbage salads, and of course, potatoes and sour cream and etc. The bigger picture is this. Americans absorb all these changes and new food and often respond with disdain and disgust towards especially poor people's food. That then eventually becomes American food, just like I would say today most Americans would consider pizza probably as American food. In fact, the National Restaurant Association has stopped classifying pizza as ethnic food uh, since uh, the year 2000. God knows what we're going to call different and distinct and ethnic in 2040. Ray says in 1924, Italian immigration drops off because of a law change. And as the years tick by, Italian Americans become more educated because of American public schools and they start making more money, which means they're more accepted into society. So by the 1950s and 60s, Americans start to eat Italian American food. Okay, so think about the famous spaghetti slurping scene in Lady and the Tramp, which is my favorite thing. That movie came out in 1955, so that was a nod to Italian-American food's popularity. Chef Boyardee had been on shelves since 1928, and when American GIs came back from Naples in 1945, they wanted more pizza. But Ray says it wasn't until the 1980s that Italian food became fancy in the United States. So this was the introduction of northern Italian food, not the southern red sauce we'd already been exposed to. This was risotto and osobuco and pumpkin ravioli with butter sage sauce. And Americans fell in love with chefs like Lydia Bastianich and Marcella Hazan. So Italian food becomes expensive and it's no longer considered, quote, ethnic. Ray says in the early 1900s, there was an article in a newspaper about how horrific and barbaric it was that Chinese people ate octopus. But by the 80s, everybody is eating fried calamari. My work on price data shows that most Americans are not willing to pay uh, more than 
kind of 10, 15 bucks for, say, Mexican dishes, Indian dishes, Chinese dishes. But they would willingly pay $35, $40 for a French dish or a Japanese dish. That's interesting. We we talk about that in Seattle because pho is really popular here. And people are used to mm-hmm. going and getting like a $7 bowl of pho. And then there have been some Vietnamese restaurants that have opened and they're using local meat. And so they're charging more. And people, yep. you know, on Yelp are like, what is this? I don't want to pay whatever, 13 to $15 for a bowl of soup. Just exactly what you said. There's an expectation that for a certain kind of food from certain countries, it should be cheap. And food from other countries, it's okay for it to be expensive, which is funny because, you know, pasta often falls in that category. And, you know, you can go somewhere and pay 24 bucks for a bowl of pasta, which costs nothing to make. You know, it's just flour and eggs. Yeah, but exactly. but psychologically, we've decided that it's that's the, okay. The, yeah, it is the value associated, the perceived value associated with it. I could talk about this all day. I think this is so interesting. But we need to move on to the star of the episode. <laughs> Not Zach Braff. Chicken parm. When we come back, the effervescent and Long Island accented Amy Pennington introduces us to what she calls slutty Italian. And we talk about how to make the perfect chicken parm. We'll be right back. Several years ago, my friend Amy Pennington invited me to a huge dinner party she was having, and the theme was slutty Italian. Now, I'd never heard of this before, but somehow I knew exactly what she was talking about without ever hearing this phrase before. So slutty Italian, is this the term that you made up or is this a thing? Totally made it up. Okay. That has no bearing on anything. It's nothing I ever (laughs) grew up with. Slutty Italian was born from my friend John, who's also a New Yorker. We met here in Seattle. Um, He grew up in the city. I grew up on Long Island. And um, we were talking about hosting this dinner and having just the food that we love that you just could not find out here. And frankly, you still cannot find out here in Seattle at all. And he was like, you know, it's just like saucy and thick and like meaty and slutty. And we just, (laughs) you know, we just sort of made it up. Yeah. And so... What kind of foods fall into the category specifically of slutty Italian food? Okay, so slutty Italian food to us that we made up are basically uh, Southern Italian. So it's sort of like a Sicilian vibe. And it's all those foods at home that like everybody eats all the time. So um, chicken Parmesan, veal Parmesan, eggplant Parmesan, anything really saucy, anything just like super oily and greasy, like, you know, slurpy. So there's this broccoli garlic pasta that um, everyone ate growing up, things like that. Red and white checkered tablecloth. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally red and white Spaghetti checkered tablecloth. and meatballs, like yes. the, the Chianti bottle with the wax coming down 100%. around the side. Yeah. That, that's exactly what we had as decor, yeah. actually. we burned In your it. house? No, no. For the slutty Italian dinner. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that we hosted. And um, yes, 100% Italian, you know, like the big night soundtrack playing. Yes. That yes, kind of vibe. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So... Was this how you ate most of the time growing up? So you're from New York, but this is like New York, New Jersey. This is kind of like the food of your people. Yes. Everyone grows up with it. Just like every pizzeria in New York, you don't, it's not just like you don't just go get pizza. You can go, you can get pizza. You can get a chicken cutlet Parmesan hero. You can, which by the way, is just chicken breast, but we don't call it that. We call it chicken cutlet. Yes. It's sliced thin, it's pounded out. Yeah. It's delicious. Um, You can go get an eggplant Parmesan. You get a meatball hero. You can get a meatball dinner with pasta. You know, like it's, (laughs) Like, you don't just go get pizza. Yeah. That's not what it's about. Okay. Why always, though, do they never put enough freaking marinara on the spaghetti when it comes on the side of your chicken parm? I feel like you get the chicken parm and then there's this like naked pasta with the little splooch on top of the marinara that looks almost like a cartoon. Like, it looks perfect. But then you stir it up and it's like so dry. You know, it's interesting. I don't know why. But I'll theorize. Okay. <laughs> Push your glasses and, up your nose. Oh, yeah, totally. There you but, go. Well, what I think is, mm-hmm. well, so when I went to Italy, Rachel, <laughs> I also noticed, actually, when I did, went to, I went to Italy in my early 20s. When you say went to Italy, you mean went to the Olive Garden, right? Because this is... No, I went thing. to Rome, okay, okay. Venezia, <laughs> Firenze. Si. And um, I was astonished at how little sauce they actually put on the pasta. Wow. Like, I was like, oh, this is very, everything is not, like, Americans just do a bigger... And more. We're so Moorish yes. in this country. It's ridiculous. I don't mean Moorish like the Spanish influence. Right, I mean not more the hyphen-ish. Yes. Right. And um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe it's that. Maybe it's just like leftover from 
their European ancestry. That's my theory. How do you make chicken parmesan? What is your secret sauce? Okay, so how I make it is how we make it in Long Island. Now, I've made it a bunch of different ways. It's just not as delicious, which may be my palate, but I think actually most people from Long Island would agree. We use seasoned Italian breadcrumbs. The Progresso Italian yeah, girl. flavor. That's what I grew up with, and it's so good. It's so good. And I've been, I just thought about this recently. I was like, why is my snobby self not just buying those because yeah. they're so good? And I'm like, I make my own breadcrumbs, and they're not as good. Well, have you ever read the ingredient? label because that might do it. That might be why. Yes. Yeah. I actually did go once and I was like, I'm going to go buy progressive seasoned breadcrumbs, which by the way, I didn't use that brand growing up, okay. but it, we sort of morphed into that as I was older. It was like, it was called 4C or Four Seasons or something. But anyway, I went and was just like, I'm gonna, just going to do it. Like yeah. such a local food, health food, whole food enthusiast. And I read the label and I, I couldn't. Yeah. I literally could not buy it. Um, so I bought the other stuff. I seasoned it by myself. I was like, this would be just as delicious. And now I just, I'm like, forget it. And I just buy progressive. Yeah. Everybody just needs a dash of partially hydrogenated something or other in yes. their blood every and once sugar, in a while. And, and sugar and like just boatloads of sodium. Corn syrup. So delish. Yeah. Okay. So Mold that's what we start with. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, there's two ways you can do it. There's a double dip and there's a single dip. So you can, you know, you have a little egg batter. So it's egg with a little bit of milk. And um, you basically pound out a chicken cutlet. So usually what I do is take a chicken breast. They're so big in this country because, you know, they're not actual chickens. They're like manufactured. Super chicken. Right. Super chicken. Slice that in half. Pound it out if you're so inclined. And when you say in half, are you talking about on the um, horizontal? Her, yes, exactly. Okay. And then you can pound it out if you're so inclined, which will make it really thin. Yeah. A little soak in the egg bath. So it's egg, breadcrumb, fry. Uh-huh. Okay. Or you can do breadcrumb, egg, breadcrumb. Fry. Oh, I do. Or flour, flour, egg, egg breadcrumbs. Yes, okay. fry. Same. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then we yeah. have our golden fried and pounded mm -hmm. chicken cutlets. Mm -hmm. And then what's the next step? Okay. So obviously you have a homemade uh, tomato sauce. Yeah. And so you would get a casserole. You would put a layer of uh, red marinara sauce on the bottom, and then you layer your chicken cutlet on top. Mm -hmm. And then you do a little marinara sauce and then maybe a little mozz, mozzarella. Oh, mozz, huh? <laughs> or mozzarella. <laughs> we're going we're going Sopranos. Style. I mean, that's yeah. my family. God forbid I walk into my house. My We're not Italian, okay? My, mo <laughs> my mom's Croatian. My dad's like a total white mix of European. And it, if I walked into that and said mozzarella or like ricotta, they yeah. would, they're like... <laughs> Regotta. Regot. <laughs> yeah, like that's, I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, when in Rome. Yeah. As they say. When in Long Island. Right. So you do another little layer of the red sauce, a little bit of mutz, shred, shredded mutz over the top. And Don't, just the standard ball that you get like the part, that, yes. the part skim. Palio. Uh-huh. Yes, mozzarella. I try and source a whole milk mutz if I could do it. Yes. Because that's really the best, not the part skim, but a lot of times you get the part skim. You have to grate it yourself. It's just a softer yes. thing. You can't buy the pre-grated mozzarella in no. the bag. Sorry, people. Uh, and you just kind of layer like that. If you want to get real slutty about it, <laughs> like I would with my big ziti, because big ziti is also the same kind of concept. Yes. So delish. You would put a few little dollops of a whole milk rigot in that there. That sounds so good. I love it's that. So it's good. so creamy. And it's such a little unexpected uh, surprise when you get it in your so mouth. So yummy. Mm, that, okay. That's the secret key. So you're layering. So I've never done it yeah. like that. So you're basically making a chicken casserole, like yeah. with layers of chicken. Because mm -hmm. I've always done just like sauce, chicken sauce mozzarella and then just kind of put it under the broiler and melt it oh, but it's like one no piece girl. at a time okay yeah girl you need a casserole and you bake that you bake that for like you know 30 minutes or so and oh you do yeah oh but and i like the crunchiness of the fried yes. chicken get soggy yes okay well i mean it doesn't you won't like crunch into a chicken but it's not about fried chicken vibe um you'll still have the flavor and it will still be crispy but it's certainly but it's not like crispy like a <laughs> You know, yeah, you're not going to bite into it, but you still get the sensation of a breaded thing. It's a good foley art right For there. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I like, I personally like my chicken parmesan a little saucier. Um, and I just, because I like when the sauce bubbles and caramelizes on top and gets a little black. So a lot of times I, I will bake it covered for 30 minutes and then like uncovered another 
you know, 10 to 15 minutes because you don't actually need to cook the chicken all the way through. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. So wait, you're saying that when you put the chicken in the casserole, it's not yeah. cooked all the way through because it's going to continue cooking have to in be. the oven. You just want the breadcrumbs to be nice and brown. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then what do you serve on the side? Oh my God, like nothing. Pasta. Yeah, just pasta. with not enough sauce. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you can, you, I like a little a bowl of sauce. Yeah. So people can sauce to their liking. Um, you must have a Parmesan Reggiano to be grated on top of, you know, your portion, of okay. course. Because I was going to say, where's the parm and chicken parm come in? Yes. Because it's always mutz. Yeah, 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 right. And actually, I'm so sorry. I should have said that when you layer it, you put a little mutz and you put a little, you grate, obviously, the Parmesan. Duh. We like a Parmigiano Reggiano. It's a company called Locatelli. Yes. Everybody gets Locatelli. It's so bloody expensive here. It's ridiculous. I literally bring home a wedge of cheese every time I go home to Long Island because I just, it's like half the price. Oh, it is. I always, well, yeah, it is expensive here. And I didn't know yeah. it was like such a prestigious cheese. It's not. It's a trashy, <laughs> slutty cheese that everybody uses. It's like every man's cheese. It's like the Velveeta of Long Island. Right. Actually, and Long Velveeta Island is kind the of Velveeta the Velveeta of, of New Island. York. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. Yeah, we actually do like a good Velveeta there. I'm not gonna lie, but yeah, that's the, that's the cheese. So you do add Parmesan along the way. To your cancer survivor, yeah, we were just talking about your short hair and how soft it is because it's yeah. all new baby hair. Yep. And you are eating super healthy, and you just came out with a new book that's all about salads. Yeah. Do you still find a place in your culinary life for slutty Italian? Oh, you know what? It was actually the first thing that um, I ate, like where I ate and I tasted it. I lo- I had head cancer, so I lost taste um, pretty significantly for a long time. Well, a couple months, and I just felt like it would be flavor flavorful and also very comforting. And so I got just a slice of pizza. I'm a total margarita. That's my thing. I don't get all the other bits and bobs on my pizza. It's cheese pizza. Boom, boom. That's it. You fold it, you eat it. A plain slice. Or just a slice. And then everybody knows what you're talking about. And um, pasta and meatballs were one of the first things I ate coming Mm -hmm. back because it was just, I think it was comfortable and it was also moist and saucy. And I needed that just for my palate, my saliva. Oh, wow. So since you've had cancer, you don't produce as much saliva? No, not at all. Hmm. No saliva? No, no. I'm I'm maybe uh, halfway back, I would say. Will it come back all the way? I don't know. They don't know. Hmm. It's been uh, eight months. So when you eat, do you have to drink a lot of water? Yeah. Or I just eat really moist food. Like Mm -hmm. I don't eat crackers or like plain, like toast. Yeah. You know, none of that is good. It's the devil's food now. <laughs> yes. It is the devil's food now. Beans. Blech. On a side note, so, <laughs> I mean, a similar thing, though, but a side note. So as somebody who's worked in food for so long and you've been writing cookbooks, what was it like to lose your taste? I mean, nobody wants to lose their taste, but for somebody who's so connected to food, yeah, was that emotionally jarring amongst all the other emotions of having cancer? You know, no. And that's why I think. I think, um, I mean, it, it's a life-threatening illness. Um, I had a rare cancer. That doesn't have super awesome... I mean, survival rates are okay, but uh, they're not slam dunky. Yeah. And you know what I actually started missing, Rachel? It wasn't food. I really missed chewing. Because I had head cancer, you have radiation to your upper carriage, and so I actually had a feeding tube. I stopped eating in June, and I did not put anything in my mouth again other than water until um, August. Wow. And I missed the sensation of just chewing or like having something in my mouth. And then as um, I started eating again, I just I actually created a boatload of aversions and I hated food for a really long time. I just started eating again, like really almost normally ish in December. Well, I'm glad that you're feeling better. Me too. Yeah, I feel great. Yeah. Our little slutty Italian who's not really Italian yeah, here in no. the studio. <laughs> I know. Croatia is so close to Italy, though. It's true. I had the best gelato I've ever had in Croatia. I thought yeah. better than in Italy. Yeah. And I just realized you're actually, the shirt you're wearing, this red and white gingham shirt, is basically a tablecloth that you would see at How a trashy you. Italian restaurant. How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> and true. you have a candle on your head burning on a bottle of Chianti. So you, <laughs> oh, I mean, always. You've turned yourself into a cliche Italian restaurant. Yes. Amy Pennington, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. And that was Zach Braff's last meal. You can watch his latest show, Alex Inc., online at abc.com. And rent Garden State at your local video store. Or go to Los Angeles and maybe you'll sit next to him at dinner. Thanks to Krishnandi Ray, department chair of the food studies program at NYU. 
If you like what you heard, you should check out his book. It's called The Ethnic Restaurateur. It's an academic look at the immigrant's perspective of working in restaurants. And can I say something? Yeah. There's a lot of his interview that didn't make it to the final podcast here. Yeah. And it was really interesting stuff about right. the story of food and the story of people. So if that's something that interests you, yeah, check it out. And thanks to Amy Pennington. Her new book, Salad Days, is out now, and it is super gorgeous. I've been leafing through, and I want to make literally every salad in the book. Amy is the author of five books, including Apartment Gardening, which is really great if you want to grow stuff in containers on your tiny New York fire escape. Find her at amy-pennington.com. This episode was produced by Aaron Mason and me, the music by Prom Queen. And please follow me on Instagram. I'm late to the party. And I want a lot of guests. So we're uh, <laughs> your last meal podcast is uh, is what I'm called on Instagram. Tell a friend about the podcast. And and I was thinking, like, next time you're playing telephone with your friends, because like it's a normal adult activity. Pass around the phrase your last meal. I feel like it's some some old school guerrilla marketing. I love telephone. I'm Rachel Bell. And until next time, this is your last meal. Oops. <clears throat> and if you go to, bleh, and if you travel it, and if you <laughs> nervous laughter, and if you travel to, and if you travel, well, I don't know, some certain things just trip me up.